opportunity to have a victim to come back to you or a survivor to come back to you to say thank you for the work that you've done to let you know how well they are doing or what their circumstances are or have become. So as a former victim, now survivor and warrior on the issues of domestic violence, I want to take the time on behalf of all of them to thank you for the work that you do. I know sometimes you get up in the morning, sit on the side of the bed and say, man, why am I going there today? Because this just seems to be getting worse and it seems there is no light in sight, but it is. So for every time you get up and you say, man, why am I going in? It's that one woman, that one child that thanks you for coming in at nine and leaving at five. Some of you work longer hours than others. Some even cross that line to make it personal to make sure that that victim or that survivor is doing well. So for them and for myself, I wanna say to you, thank you. Continue to do your work. Continue to persevere. Take every 45 days you need to take a break. Tell your supervisors you need to get off. Rather it be a three day weekend or three days during the week, you need 40, every 45 days you need to disconnect, disengage, to have time for yourself and for your family so that you can heal as you strive to heal other victims and survivors of domestic violence. Most of you know my story. John Allen Muhammad, the DC sniper, was my ex-husband. Most people don't know that I was the intended target. He was killing innocent people to cover up my murder so that he could come in and get custody of the children. So it was a domestic violence child custody issue. Unfortunately, those issues were not covered in court because they would not have been able to get the death penalty for it. So my case was not settled in court. But to go back to bring you to why all of that happened, I, the, the abuse that I suffered was not physical. It was verbal, psychological, it was stalking, it was economic, and it was spiritual. I asked John for a divorce. He didn't want that, so he started coming in in the middle of the night, standing over me, walking around the bed to see if I was breathing, listening, stood up, left out the house. He did that three times. He had our phone numbers changed without my permission. Ultimately, I went to court. The judge gave me a lifetime restraining order. I don't know if they give those out anymore, but he said, you need to get away from this guy. And I said, your honor, I'm really trying to do that. He, we had to have visitation for the children. And most times victims, we want the abuser not understanding the dynamics of that, to be a father to their children. But we didn't have a parenting plan. He was able to take them out of the country without my permission. And because we didn't have a parenting plan, then the judge said that, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. Police officers, law enforcement couldn't do anything about that because a parenting plan was in place. While in Antigua, where he took them, that's where he met Lee Malvo. He brought Lee, Lee in as the big brother over our children, and so Lee and our children became best friends. Ultimately, they came back to the United States. I was able to get the, the shelter that I was living in, found out that the children were in Bellingham, Washington. I had to send all of my paperwork there in order to go back to Tacoma, Washington to have an emergency custody hearing. He tried to attack us in the courtroom. The judge gave me custody of the children. We left there, came back here. That was in September of 2001. 2002 is when the shootings began. And we were all looking for two Caucasians in a white box truck. Well, I was looking for that and I was looking for John too. October the 23rd is when the FBI came to my door asking when was the last time I had heard from John and I told them that it was a year ago, 2001. Went down to the police station. They asked me, did I notice a, a letter that was posted to the tree? I said no. They asked me to listen to a CD that had a voice on it and did I recognize the voice? I said no. And that's when they told me, Ms. Muhammad, we're gonna name your ex-husband as the sniper, and did you know that you were the target? So they put me and my children and my sister and brother-in-law in protective custody 
until they caught him. So how did he find me? He went to a father's rights group in Tacoma, Washington, told them I kidnapped the children. They didn't do a background check, nor did they verify his story. They found me in the D.C. area and they told him. He went to his best friend and said, I found Mildred, I'm on my way to get her. That best friend in the midst of the shootings called the FBI and told them, I don't know anything about your case, but you may want to look at John Allen Muhammad. His ex-wife is in the area and he may be there to hurt her. That is when the investigation changed and that is when they put me and my children into protective custody. So my children are 20, my son is 25. He's a assistant manager at a jewelry store. If y'all need some jewelry, I'll tell y'all where to go. <laughs> and my daughters are, are in college. One graduated, one is still there. They majored in vocal performance and they both sing opera in eight different languages. So I've become an international national spokesperson on the issues of domestic violence, as well as speaking to the military community on PTSD, suicide, depression. I just came back from Virginia Beach speaking to the naval base. There are 22 soldiers that commit suicide every day. And as I was speaking and mentioned that statistic, a soldier came up to me after the presentation and said, Ms. Muhammad, I was your husband, your ex-husband, before he went to Saudi. Now I'm at ground zero. My life is worth nothing and I'm gonna kill myself. I said, well, you know, you need to have a seat over there. And I was able to get him the help that he needed in order to move forward. And for all of you, for all of you, just because we're service providers does not immune us to being victims or survivors. I've had executive directors to contact me for help because they were in a situation that they could not tell their board about or to let anyone else know for fear of shame and guilt. So if any of you are in that type of situation and you can't go to your colleague, you need to check that because you should be able to go to your colleague or to your friend to tell them, tell them that you are a victim of domestic violence. So please take care of yourself. If you need to have someone to talk to because you're feeling emotionally strained, because this is an emotional job, and it takes special people to do this work, and you're all special people, and you need to take care of yourself. So thank you for coming to this awesome conference. Thank you for listening to my story. And please, even though you get tired, continue to get up and continue to help us because we need you. Thank you.